My name is Clark Bannock. Um, I'm from the Alberta Center for Sustainable Rural Communities at the Augustana campus of the University of Alberta in Camrose. And in 2019, we received an anti-racism community grant from the government of Alberta to do a bit of research, but also some community outreach on the topic of cultural diversity and racism in rural Alberta. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to cancel a number of those outreach activities in a number of different small towns across Alberta. So in lieu of those activities, we've created this video resource as a way to share some information for rural organizations or rural community leaders who are interested in hosting their own kind of community event, their own community conversation on this topic. Now, I'm from rural Alberta. I know that there are lots of kind, open-minded citizens out there who are working hard to welcome newcomers to their communities. I also know that being good neighbors is something that we as rural Albertans you know, pride ourselves on, is very important to us. But I also know that negative attitudes towards cultural minorities, towards Indigenous Canadians, do exist in pockets of rural Alberta in the same way they exist in pockets of, of urban Alberta. Furthermore, we're living in an age wherein social media seems to be inflaming these negative attitudes. And this can have real consequences, real negative consequences for rural communities. On one level, we do know that newcomers to Canada and Indigenous Canadians sometimes report feeling unwelcome in rural communities. Tensions have risen at times between different cultural groups, even incidents of violence across the rural prairies. On another level, we know that this can make it difficult for rural communities to attract immigrants. And this is a real problem. Research is very, very clear that for many rural communities, attracting immigrants is the key to their long-term economic future, their economic sustainability. So the question then becomes, how do we increase our inclusiveness? How do we become more inclusive rural communities? The overall goal that we are aiming for in this type of work is intercultural awareness, a situation where citizens in your community acknowledge cultural diversity, they treat with respect and value all cultures equally, and individuals from all cultures are accorded an equal opportunity to participate in community life. This is the end goal, okay? Now, it's a long road to get here. You do not get here overnight. Um, but again, the research is quite clear that two things in particular are really important in terms of moving towards this goal and becoming a much more inclusive community that is interculturally aware. On one hand, making education about different cultural groups available to your citizens is important. So is intercultural dialogue, creating opportunities where different groups of people in your community can have meaningful conversation. We know that these are hugely important and generally, if, if they're designed properly, tend to be quite successful in terms of moving communities towards more inclusivity. Now, that being said, it's not always the best idea to rush headlong into these activities. In fact, it's often best to start with a broader community conversation that is designed to encourage personal reflection and build empathy in as many citizens of your community as possible. This is a really important first step. And in doing so, you're building a more receptive audience for those educational opportunities and that intercultural dialogue which come next. Now, when you're facilitating this type of broad community conversation, a couple things, introductory things to keep in mind. One, you definitely want to meet people where they are, okay? You're not coming into this meeting, you know, ready to spew out a bunch of academic mumbo jumbo. You're not overwhelming people with reams of statistics, nor are you seeking to make people feel, you know, guilty about the positions they may very well hold, okay? Rather, you really want to be facilitating something that is sensitive to the realities of rural life. It's pitched at the appropriate level. And it's designed in such a way where people have room to say what they need to say. This is important. Within reason, of course, you don't want to create a form where blatant hateful language is being spewed about. Certainly not. Having done some research 
to public opinion in rural Alberta. I know there's a certain degree of anger in rural communities built up around the notion that A, governments aren't necessarily supporting rural communities in, in meaningful ways anymore as, the, as they did in the past. And B, governments seem to be doing much more to help newcomers to Canada or Indigenous Canadians. This way of thinking is, is quite common in rural Alberta right now, feeling that they have been left behind, whereas the government is, is, is working to support these other groups. And this in turn generates a, kind of a, a negative energy, a negative attitude towards these cultural groups, towards Indigenous Canadians. As tempting as it is to cut, cut someone off once they start going down this road in your community conversation, this isn't really the time to be picking fights with your audience, okay? It's, it's important to understand that people need to feel heard before they can open their minds to other ideas. And even if people feel that, you know, government is mistreating them, there are ways to change the way people think about cultural minorities or indigenous Canadians in this context, okay? Without shutting them down at, at, at this point. So with these introductory comments out of the way, I want to introduce you briefly to three different activities that I think would, would do a really good job of encouraging this personal reflection and building empathy in your community conversation. The first of these I've simply labeled your family story. The idea is, is very simple. Give your participants a couple minutes to share their own family story with respect to when they came to Canada. Okay, everyone, unless you're Indigenous, everyone has a family story about when they came to Canada, whether it was one year ago or a hundred years ago, right? And allowing people to share and reflect on their story at, at this point is a really good introductory exercise for at least three, three reasons. First, in, it really does highlight the fact that the, your rural community is much more culturally diverse um, than you re than you probably realize, each of each of the families who are there, each of the each of the individuals are there, are going to be able to trace their family lineage to a whole host of different countries and and, and cultural backgrounds. Right, something that we we don't often think about. Second, despite the differences in in timelines or countries of origin, and some important similarities are going to emerge across the stories that are shared at, at this event, but also similarities that are going to emerge with respect to newcomers to Canada today, okay? No matter the case, no matter how many year, years ago, how many decades ago a particular family came to Canada, it's often the case that that family came to this country for land, for a better opportunity for their family, and there, there often is a particular reason why they felt they had to leave the old country, whether it was war, whether it was you know political or religious tension, whether it was, you know, economic reasons, it may very well have been just, you know, very difficult to find a job at that particular point. Maybe even famine was setting in. It does not always immediately connect with us, but in almost all cases, those those who are coming to Canada today as newcomers are coming for the exact same reason. Things are not so good for them in their home country, and they're they're turning to Canada looking for a better environment to support their family, right? Third, this exercise highlights the fact that unless we are Indigenous, our families were all, at, at one point, immigrants. This is something that is, is both obvious, but really easy to forget, especially in the context of these conversations of, around cultural diversity and, and who belongs. This is also a really good time to read your Indigenous land acknowledgement statement. I understand that these statements sometimes aren't popular in rural communities, and it's also become, you know, a, a pretty ingrained custom to open your event with this statement. I'm suggesting hold off for a few minutes and, and, and read it here. Once participants have had the opportunity to, you know, reflect on their own immigrant stories, it obviously creates a much, you know, wider window to meaningfully reflect on what that statement means. A second activity that I think is quite helpful in, the, in this type of introductory community conversation, I've, I've labeled exploring stereotypes. Begin a bit of a conversation with a broad question that, that I think is would be interesting but also important for your participants to think through. 
what does it mean to be rural? What makes us different from people who live in big cities? Why do we choose to live here and not in downtown Edmonton or downtown Calgary? Okay, what is it about the rural life that we really appreciate? This is a this is a good question to kind of begin reflecting on on, on what it means to be rural, but it's it's going to lead in very well to the next question. After you've given people a couple minutes to share, push them a little bit farther by asking them to reflect on the stereotypes that exist about us as rural citizens. Okay, how do how do some city people view us as rural citizens? The most common image that, that's going to emerge in this conversation is that of the you know, backward thinking hillbilly or redneck. It's a very common negative image that, that, that is placed upon rural citizens, right? How do we as rural citizens feel about this portrayal of us? How would we want to challenge city people who think about us in that way? So you're inviting citizens here to reflect on being the target of a negative stereotype. This then creates a window where you can flip the script in a gentle way. Ask them what stereotypes they hold about city folks. You know, allow them to reflect on certain beliefs they hold about city people, right? And including some of the more negative associations we would have with those who live in the city. And once you've done that, you can take a few minutes to talk through these and, and point to examples that show how these stereotypes don't actually hold for all city people. So you're raising awareness here in a lack of the truth in stereotypes. We know that the negative stereotypes that you know, city people might hold about rural citizens aren't necessarily true. And now we've talked about how some of our stereotypes with respect to city people are you know, also not entirely true. And this of course provides an opportunity to push them even further. Ask them what stereotypes they hold about certain cultural groups or indigenous Canadians, okay? Let them share their views here. But again, this, this is creating a window to gently push back you know, a bit more even. Use examples or stories um, that would resonate with rural people that demonstrate how these negative stereotypes we, we identified are often just as off base as those about us as rural citizens. Okay, really good exercise to again, encourage that reflection, build that empathy. The Third activity I list here, um, the, acknowledging the reality of stereotypes. What, what I'm really getting at here is it's important to acknowledge that we all hold stereotypes based on biases we have, often unconscious biases, okay? And in the slide, there's a link to a YouTube video that introduces an audience to the notion of unconscious bias. It's a very short, it's three or four minutes. I'd encourage you to show it to, to your participants. Um, it, it, it explores the idea really well, uh, very simply, and it also narrows in on a particular concept, that of affinity bias. The notion that we as human beings are hardwired to respond positively to people who look, act, or sound like us. So in other words, it's natural to be hesitant when first encountering a new culture. And in fact, we all do this, whether we recognize it or not the first time we're encountering someone new. And the reason this happens is your, your brain is always making shortcuts to allow you to process new information as you go about your day. It doesn't take the time to reason through the initial judgments it makes with respect to you know who is friendly and who may not be friendly. And so it's not um, taking the time to, you know, reason through something and, and, and realize that these initial judgments may not be, in fact, correct. Now, to be honest, it takes a lot of time and work to think clearly about the biases we have and especially how it affects how we judge other people. But not doing this can have real consequences. Not doing this is what leads you into discriminatory behavior, even if it's unconscious discriminatory behavior. If we are simply following our unconscious biases, especially with respect to new, new groups of people, new cultures, we end up in a situation where we are treating someone from a particular group poorly, whether, whether we realize it or not, whether it's a seemingly innocent example of you know, cracking that joke about, about a particular group of people or you know, not defending a particular group of people when they are the butt of that joke, but it, it can get much more serious much more quickly you know, this is when, you know, you're refusing to help them 
if they are in need. You're refusing to hire them at your store. You're refusing to shop at their store, right? And it can go even further. You're, you're literally telling them they don't belong here. They're not welcome in our community. Now, this is clearly problematic behavior, um, and it's clearly not living up to our own moral standards as being good neighbors. Again, that idea that's so central to being rural that, that we cling to as an important moral ideal. But reflecting back on the stereotypes you have, that we all have, built upon these, these internal biases that we have, is a really important step in, in, in addressing that type of behavior. So that concludes the um, overview of these three activities that I think would, would really suit you well to guide this community conversation you are going to host. Um, a couple comments just to wrap this up very quickly. One, obviously, this is just a first step. Holding this community conversation and working through these types of ex these reflective exercises with community members is not going to solve all the problems. You're not going to come out of this the next day with a perfectly inclusive community. You you will not have achieved that meaningful intercultural awareness that you know is that ultimate goal. Um, but but understand that this is an important first step in that process. Once you've done this and you, you've encouraged people to reflect, to build empathy, you are ready for kind of those next stages of, of cultural education, of intercultural dialogue that can play really important roles as you move towards inclusivity. Second, there is a bit of a danger in advocating for anti-racism when you have not experienced racism yourself. And this obviously applies to me as well as, as a white male. You may even be taken to task by some for daring to speak for others in this respect, but it's important to remember that you are not pretending to be someone you are not in this process. Your job is simply to begin the process of encouraging this personal reflection and building empathy in your community down the road when cultural education and inter intercultural dialogue become important parts of this process. This is when people who have experienced racism, whether it's in a rural community or in other instances, will have the space to discuss these experiences and speak to them. And you can imagine how, how important and powerful a tool this is to hear from these individuals. But this isn't necessarily the best first step and that's why I've, I've spoken about using this community conversation built around these exercises as a first step um, in this, again, long process to building intercultural awareness. Finally, on this slide, there are some really helpful resources that you, you might want to look up that could help you as you prepare for your own event. And the Alberta Center for Sustainable Rural Communities contact information is here should you have any questions. Thank you very much for listening.